Okay, so there are a few other items worthy of mention before we put this engine in the car. Now, when we burn fuel, of course, we're getting energy from it, but we have a lot of lost energy as well, and that's in the form of heat. Now, we do use some of that heat through these pipes here, which go to the heater inside the car, and we'll have a look at that in a moment and how that works. Here's the heater box. It uses hot water from the engine or coolant from the engine. It goes in one side, comes out the other. And it passes air through that device. Now, if I show you down here you can see this the heater core is this thing here it's like a radiator each of those vertical tubes has coolant traveling down through it and by having fins attached to them it makes the surface area of it huge so rather than having one vessel to pass water over or pass air over we've got all these little fins and the air goes right through each and every one of them and picks up heat off them it's a very efficient way of transferring it now if we look this way the fan mounts in this hole here, so the air is going to come from the fan and through the heater core down that channel there. I'm just hoping you can see in there. Now when I move it, it blocks off the heater core and insulates it. And so the cold air will go straight through there. That is the setting you'd have it on if the air conditioner was here. right? The air conditioner fits here and the fan's on the other side of it. So when you want cold from your air conditioning, you're blocking the core off. The air conditioning will be on anyway if you have it on defrost. Um, it is a dehumidifier, but the cold air from the air conditioner will then pass through here and warm up. Now, if you don't have your air conditioning on at all, the air will be a lot warmer as it passes through there. So this is a manual heater. It's all done by controls by the driver. Uh, there is also the fully automated one, the climate control, on the other car, which I'll show you afterwards. The other thing to note here is there's two items here, an alternator. So the vehicle relies on a battery and the battery powers the ECU or the computer and the battery powers the headlights and all the other ancillaries in the car that require electricity is all provided by the battery but we can run the vehicle without a battery but it wouldn't run for very long the battery needs to be replenished and so we have an alternator and an alternator produces alternating current which is a sine wave and it's converted internally by by way of a rectifier into DC and that is produced and the output's there that goes off to the battery and there's also a regulator inside which will monitor the amount of charge going to the battery and when it needs to open and close the regulator circuitry so we don't want to overcharge the battery and cook it we just want to put enough in to replenish it and when the battery is full the regulator tells it when to stop or at least when to stop charging the fact is the alternator will still rotate uh, on the engine as it's running but it won't be producing power in that condition. Another thing that uses a lot of battery power is this thing under here. That's the starter motor. That thing there, and there's a solenoid at the top of it. The solenoid is like a massive relay. If you look there, there's a very large cable that goes on there, so it carries a huge amount of current. That motor is designed to spin the engine to the point where it can start. An internal combustion engine can't go unless it's rotated first then firing can start happening within the engine and of course it can run but to get that initial firing happening we have to spin the engine that's done by that electric motor without a, a way to cool the engine it would overheat and be pretty well useless um, it would cook so to speak so we have a cooling system now we don't want to cool the engine down when it's cold and there's a thermostat in there to stop that. So there is a unit inside this housing which will stop water flow. But when the engine heats up, that will open up and it will provide flow. And that flow is provided by this water pump. The water pump is driven by a belt off the engine and circulates the coolant throughout the engine. Now water pumps in cars are not positive displacement pumps, they're centrifugal pumps. Here's an old Holden one. And it works in the same principle. Coolant goes in here and is thrust out sideways from this impeller. From there, it's gathered out in a housing and forced through the engine. Now, a good example of a centrifugal action um, is when you wash your clothes or other articles in a washing machine. You open the lid when you're finished and all the clothes are stuck to the outside of the tub. And that is happening because of centrifugal force. So in the case of this pump, we've got a tube which is full of the cooled water from the radiator, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And it's thrust out sideways into the engine here. If 
via that housing. Centrifugal pumps like this, as we said, are not positive displacement. They can't self-prime, so you can't have the level of the coolant below the pump because it won't have the power to draw it up. These are reliant on being primed or being below the level of the water. And when we say priming, we're talking about the, the pipe that comes into the pump being full of water to begin with. The other type of uh, device for flowing air or water is an axial flow fan. And a ship's propeller, for example, is a hydro example of an axial flow fan. It just means when the fan is spinning, airflow is parallel to the centre axis of the fan. Another example of that would be a desk fan in your house or maybe a pedestal fan. The turbine engines on the wings of aircraft have an axial flow fan at the front to feed the turbine engine behind them. Let's have a look at a hydraulic system and that is the clutch. Here is a slave cylinder and there's a hydraulic pipe going into it. When we put our foot on the clutch in the car we push it all the way down. More movement than what we need here. That pushes a piston in here and disengages the clutch by moving that lever out. That disconnects the engine from the transmission or the gearbox so that they're no longer connected to the drive wheels. And we use that when we change gear. And here's the clutch master cylinder. It's wobbly now because it hasn't been connected to the pedal. The pedals aren't in the car yet. But it's connected directly to the pedals which push a piston. There's your, your fluid reservoir through this tube and of course into the slave cylinder. Here we have a simple hydraulic setup. There are two pistons, these are just syringes, but they're great for illustrating this sort of thing. We have a smaller one, which has to travel further than this larger one. And this is perfect for demonstrating how a clutch is actuated. The pedal has to go down further than what the slave cylinder has to actuate the clutch. So by pushing it, I'll try and do it here so it's more visible. This one doesn't have to go nearly as far, but given the surface area of the piston so much bigger, the force coming out will be a lot greater than what this has to be to initialize it. Okay, so the brakes work in a similar fashion. These are what are called dual circuit brakes. So there's two pistons in here and you can see two lines are coming off. They then go into a proportioning valve down there and they're distributed to the four wheels. So we're now looking at the gearbox. There are a few things on here worthy of mention. There are little stays and brackets for the wiring lamps when we put the engine in the car. There's a speedometer drive, which turns the speedo cable, as we've mentioned. And there are these levers, here and here. They allow gear changing, and it's very, they need to be very precise in the way they move, so we don't select two gears at once, and we get a smooth transition from one gear to the other. They're actuated by two cables. Here's our gear shifter housing. It bolts to the floor inside the car. There are two cables coming out. One of the cables controls the movement that you would experience between first and second or third and fourth. When we want to go across to reverse or into fifth or back to any of the other gears, we use this one. So they push and pull. And so when we connect this to the gearbox, we get a good, efficient way of changing gear. Let's do that now. Now the cables are fitted. I'll probably get this wrong, so forgive me if I do like that and this one I think goes in like that and they're held in with clips I'll just go and find those and we'll watch a bit of gear action all right we've got some parts here these are off another car but they'll do fine for the purpose of demonstration we have to lock these cables in with some horseshoe clips and then we have to put these washers on and some fasteners to keep these down where we need them to be. Whoops, if we don't drop them. Because I do drop stuff. But anyway, that's one and the other one goes here. So let's see what happens when we go to change gear. I've got that cable twisted, but for the purpose of demonstration, it should be all right. Right, there is neutral. And you can see both of those are idling there. First is over to the left and up. Neutral, second. And then we go third, fourth. So when we're doing this in neutral, third and fourth are being selected on a different plane in that top one there. Reverse is over here and down. 
So that is how they work. So let's have a look at this. These engines are designed to idle at 800 RPM with a maximum spinning speed of 6000 RPM. That's its red line. What that means is this pulley here, connected directly to the crankshaft, is spinning 800 times every 60 seconds at idle and 6000 times every 60 seconds at full tilt. Now the ratio, we've got a diameter here of 136 and we've got a diameter here of 100. So we divide that into that, and that gives a ratio of 1.36, and we can multiply the engine revolutions by 1.36 to find out what that is spinning at. So at 3,000 RPM, and these are traditionally driven between 2.5 and 3,000 in normal, 3,500, sorry, in normal driving conditions. So at 3,000 RPM, that's spinning at 4,080 RPM. And at full tilt, when we're going 6,000 on the crankshaft, this guy is spinning at 8,160 revolutions per minute. That's important because it's factored into the engineering of the pump. It's a centrifugal pump, like we said before, but we have to factor in things such as cavitation. We can also work out what the alternator pulley is turning at, and the alternator pulley has a pitch diameter of around 60 millimetres, and I'll let you work that out. Before we fit the engine is some of the dash components. These are sort of self-adhesive um, aluminium tape sections, I think to stop resonance or something. We've got a rattle can with contact adhesive in. So I'll just spray a bit on each one. And some on the inside of the vehicle in the corresponding area. One here. One here. Where's the other one? There. Now this is going to confuse me because I can't remember how it goes. Um, I think it goes like this. The purpose of it is for heat, to stop heat coming through from the engine, and also noise. They're the two reasons it's there. Um, it's got uh, a slot at the top here, so I'm assuming it's for that, and that would be for the brake master. So I've sort of got the opinion it's going to go in something like this. Um, but I'm not overly sure, unless it fits under. There's another part of the loom that has to come through there, and then that goes all the way back. And there are clasps that sort of fasten it. Some of the fasteners to how to use are very tricky. They're designed to fit over a fine thread, but they click into position so you can get them through the hole, and then that part locks off. And they're every, well, there's four of them. There's one there, there's one here. There's one somewhere else. I've got to put one here as well. And so feeding them, whoops, feeding them through can be a bit challenging, but they're perfect things. They work really well. I can put the um, gear shift in. I'd sooner do it after, but I'm going to do it now because it just makes life easier when the engine's in. These pass through those holes, or that hole. Um, I've had to line up that grommet. I've lost, I don't know what's happened to the front part of it. I really don't know what I've done with it. So, you know, that's a bit of a, a bit of a problem. Um, the gear shift just sits on the floor, basically. So that will, you know, I'll just tighten that up. I don't need to talk about it anymore. Got our little cherry picker. We've got an engine strapped to it. We've got a car, and I think it's ready to go in. We've got the shift cables in. Cover over the steering pinions there. And I think we're good. I might just tie those, um, I might tie those cables back. Uh, this is loose. I've left that high pressure line for the power steering loose, so I can lift it up, because one of the mounts has to go in here. So, let's lift the engine up. Well, let's pick this up on an angle. I don't know if that's the right angle, but we'll give it a go. Would you like me to sing while I'm doing this? Oh, I didn't think so. I'm going to move it closer to the car and get it nice and high. 
I normally lift an engine up and leave it still in the wheel of car into it, but I need to get underneath this. Oops. So, I'm going to move them over that way a bit. Don't mind, little fella. Stay right there. Don't move. And we won't pop the exhaust out of the way. Yes, that's going to be quite tricky. I might take the wheels off too. Hang on, Rose. I'll pop that wheel off. It'll give us more room. They, <laughs> it's sort of around about in the right spot to fall. Well, hopefully it will fall to lower into the car. Um, the part I'm worried about is the engine runs very close to that sh that frame rail, and the back of the gearbox. This gear, this is in the way. So we'll lower it down a bit and see what happens, eh? That's a good boy. Here we go. And we'll just stop about there. Have a look and see how we are in terms of proximities. And we're very close over here in terms of it's going to hit. And that's even worse news. Hmm. Let's think about this. Right, we're not quite there yet. Just going to push it over that way a bit. And then I'll lift it as I lower it. But I might need some help. Um, I think another thing I can do is pull it outward toward the outside of the car a little bit. Just making sure we don't do it too much because you've got that whole pendulum effect, which means we can start knocking into this stuff. So I've had an epiphany. I'm going to bring it over this way. And just wangle it around so I can get it to fall in exactly the right place. That sounded bad. Just a moment. Oh, good, that's plenty of clearance. I've got a hose stuck, but that's all. Still in reasonably good shape. Alright, it's looking a little bit better, but not too bad. So, if I pull it back a little bit. Come on. Okay, just a moment. Just a moment. What have we got? We may need to move him out of the way. We're all clearing at the back, which is rather good. That's a good result. Um, we can almost start bolting it in. At this point, we'll drop our front engine man in because it's fun. And it fits into that groove there. So there's a nut and a couple of bolts. So we'll just get that sorted out. There's an earth strap goes on there. Oh, great. That's wonderful. And. We'll rest it in its place and lower the back and bolt the back of it on, hey? That sounds like wonderful fun. So let's pop a jack into the gearbox to level the engine out. And that will bring it into sort of the right orientation for the front mount. Something like that. And also the gearbox. We've got to put that mount on too. Well, I've scratched up the back and thrown the edge, but it doesn't matter. I can just touch over that. I'm just going to pop this mount in. Sweet. There we have it. The engine is in. And I don't think we need to do any more today. Um, it's all a good bit of work we've done, so... Oh, we not do it either. So we'll pack up. Ooh. It's only in the morning and quite cold. I'm just plugging the speed. Okay, well, these are the fuel injectors. And you know if the wiring's right, because it'll sort of only go one way. This is off a different model, but the engine's the same. Um, now I'm saying this is trying to get these on. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? There we go. And there. So we've got a master cylinder switch over here. I'm not sure if you can see where you are. Yeah, you should be able to see it. Um, non power steered cars have a bracket and they hold it to the firewall or to the shock tower. That's what that is called. Um, this one doesn't because we've fitted power steering to it. So we can do away with this one. And that bracket then fits into, I'll bring him over here so you can see what I'm talking about. So once we've removed the bracket, 
the switch for the master cylinder. Just fits in there. And the switch is for low fluid. Or there's a brake problem and it the piston in the cylinder is not returning to where it's supposed to be. Um we can pop the bottle in for the PO steering. I'm just gonna get that. Here's our power steering reservoir. Stores fluid for the steering. And I've I'm done the wrong one. <laughs> just gonna take the tape off here. This is painter's tape, it's pretty good stuff, but it still does when it's mixed with oil. Get a gluggy sort of residue on it. Hopefully it comes off with no issue. Which it did, which is great. Just having trouble getting it off my gloves now. Come on, what are you doing? Off you get. Good. Right. So that will plug into there. Just like that. I might have to cap that off again because I'm not ready to put the pump on. And then we can just bolt him up. Well, that's looking one or two steps closer to complete. I'm just going to do a couple of touch ups around the battery train with a brush. Um, there's no more I really want to do up here for now. I've got to put the heater box in, the air conditioning in, and all this sort of stuff. But I need to get underneath and put the drive shafts in. We'll talk about those. And also wire up the starter motor and the alternator. This is an internal combustion engine. It's a four-cylinder engine with a capacity of 1300 cc's or 1.3 litres. Now when we put fuel in a car, we fill the vehicle via this area here. That nozzle is a spring flap, it's designed for unleaded fuel, so we're using a petroleum product in this vehicle. So the fuel runs through the filler, into that large pipe, and into this tank where it's stored. Now the fuel tank in this car is mounted underneath the back seat. Once it's in the tank, it's gonna come across that thing. It's normally covered by that silver cover next to it, but I wanna talk about what that does now. And here is the device here. There's a plug on the top. That's the top of the tank, which we saw in the car. That's the bottom, so we know the tank's that deep. These wires are connected to a connector inside the fuel tank. Two of them go to the fuel pump, and the other three go down to this device here. Now that device has a float attached to it, which varies resistance. So as you're driving the car over several hundred kilometers and the, f the fuel starts to get lower, the resistance changes in here and corresponds to the fuel gauge. It starts to point towards empty. As you fill up, the float obviously floats on top of the fuel and the resistance is a different measurement, of course, or a different value, which corresponds to the full on the fuel tank. There's a node which displays a light on the dash to tell you that the fuel level is low. You can see it's only, you know, that far from the bottom of the tank. This is the fuel pump here, which is a high pressure fuel pump for the fuel injection. It's submerged in fuel and it uses fuel running through it as a lubricant and a way of cooling it. The intake's here where the strainer is at the base of the tank. The output is on top of the unit where this banjo bolt is and that hooks up to a fuel line and is tightened down with two aluminium gaskets sealing it off. The other pipe here is the fuel return line. It just runs back into the tank and is pushed away. So it sort of goes against the grain thinking of something electrical submerged in fuel, but it's perfectly safe. It then runs through a series of lines and into the engine bay. Now there's a few lines there. There's fuel delivery line, there's fuel return line, there's a fuel vapour line and some brake lines as well. Now once the fuel comes up into the engine bay, the first port of call is a filter, a high pressure filter. From there, the fuel runs across and into this rail here. That's the fuel rail. Connected directly to the fuel rail at each of the four injectors, being a four cylinder engine. Now the fuel rail has its pressure maintained at a specific level. Let's think of it as about the same as what you've got in your tyres, about 200 kilopascals, maybe a bit more. This device here is a pressure regulator. So anything over and above that pressure is bled off and sent down that pipe back to the fuel tank. Right, so this vehicle is electronically fuel injected and it uses a computer to 
determine when the spark fires through these plugs here and when the fuel is injected through the fuel injectors here. They're the two outputs the computer puts out, but in order for it to supply an output, it needs to know a lot of information about what the engine's doing by way of its inputs. So if you look at a desktop computer, there are inputs and outputs. Your inputs would be things like your mouse, your keyboard, your microphone if you're using one. Outputs would be your speakers, your monitor, that sort of thing. And we looked at Arduinos when you're in year eight and we discussed inputs and outputs. You use commands, digital read, digital write, delay, um, LED high, LED low, all these sorts of things and delay times to get the LED to flash at different rates. We even simulated a guy dying on an operating table by having a beep <laughs> and it was <laughs> outputting to pin 5 did it, did it, did it, dee. <laughs> and we even had um, through a serial print line using a potentiometer turning left and right would display on the uh, monitor the um, the fact that you had the knob left or right or the potential to left or right and one very bright chap Chanul um, got the left and right working but it didn't say left and right it said something else we're not going to go into that right so let's have a look at what these sensors do in the terms of this computer now this computer if you think about this these cars first used these computers in this country in 1996 uh, in Japan, it could have been a lot earlier, I'm not sure. But in 1996, I think the desktop computers at the time were things like Pentium 75s, 100s, 133s. And that was the clock speed the processor ran at. Typically, they would have 4, 8, 16 meg of RAM, 840, 1.2 gig, uh, or 840 meg and 1.2 gig hard disk and all this sort of business. And multimedia was becoming, becoming very fashionable. People would fit sound cards and all this sort of stuff into their computers and play games and yeah, anyway. Those machines are infinitely more powerful than what this car needs to run. It's a very modest computer in terms of a microcontroller, which is a small computer embedded in the vehicle's ECU or electronic control unit. We'll show you what that looks like in a moment. But it only runs a dedicated program with a set of lookup tables which tell the computer what to do in given circumstances by way of its inputs. Two rather important inputs. The TPS, which is this black thing here. That's the throttle position sensor. It tells the computer where the driver's foot is by way of the accelerator pedal. We've got MAP sensor, manifold absolute pressure. It measures the vacuum in the engine. Now this tells the computer a lot about what load the engine's under. So if the car is idling, there's a butterfly in here. Let me just lower that and show you the butterfly. I'm not certain you can see it. There's a butterfly that opens and closes in there. It's just a, like a brass disc. So these two inputs work quite well together. If the throttle butterfly is closed or barely open, so you're doing 60 and you're in fourth gear and you're just coasting along nice and quietly, there's a good amount of vacuum in here. This is the plenum chamber of sorts and the pipes coming off it into the engine are the intake runners. These are quite long, which gives it a good amount of torque. Race engines use very short ones that are quite opened up, quite wide. Now, at a coasting speed or an idle speed, we've got pistons going up and down inside the engine. They're opening or they're going down when the intake valves open, so there's a lot of suction or vacuum in this area here. So that tells the computer that the engine's not doing much work. It's just coasting along and so it adjusts the fuel intake and the spark timing accordingly. When we're going flat out, or the throttle's wide open, the MAP sensor loses vacuum, it picks up that there's a loss of vacuum, the TPS is registering it's wide open, the computer's saying, radio, this chap wants to go really, really quickly, or he's going up a hill fast or whatever, let's open up the fuel injectors, give it more fuel, and adjust the timing accordingly. So it's not just about going fast, it's also about knowing what the engine is doing in terms of its temperature. The computer needs to know if the engine's cold in the morning and it's being warmed up, so it gives a little bit more fuel to make it richer. With the optimum fuel air ratio being 14 to 1, uh, anything above that, so 15 to 1 will be a lean condition, as in not enough fuel, or 13 to 1 and lower will be rich. It needs to know the temperature and also needs to know when it's a normal operating temperature or if it's beginning to overheat. Now that 
is by way of a coolant temperature sensor. So I can tell the computer about the coolant temperature or the temperature of the engine. There's a green one yeah, over there. That's just a switch to turn the fans on. That's not, modern computers have them or modern ACUs have them, um, have the cooling fans controlled by the ACU. This car doesn't, it's just a switch. And of course this grey one here is just a switch to turn the reverse lights on when you select reverse gear. Now most fuel injected engines use a crank angle sensor which tells the computer exactly the position of the crankshaft in terms of where it is in its rotation. Uh, these cars don't have one. It's normally located on the front of the engine near the pulley. I'll show you that in a moment. This car uses a crank position sensor on the distributor and uh, which is not usual but it's obviously a very reliable system. Crank angle sensors are normally mounted under that plastic cover near the front pulley down there at the bottom. Of course on the exhaust system underneath there is also the O2 sensor. I'll show you one of those. It measures the amount of unburned oxygen exiting the engine and again that can determine what the engine does in terms of air fuel ratio. Again we're also as we said we're looking for an optimal value of 14 to 1. Now anything can happen in an engine. Things can go wrong and in that case the computer will lodge and store codes. They're just fault codes and it's read through this diagnostics box here. That's an old Toyota system as I think I said before in the last video. Um, now it's all ABD2 stuff so it's all sort of standardized fittings but the apparatus to read the codes um, uses different programs which can be installed that are relevant to each different model uh, of vehicle. The codes can mean anything though. If we have a lot of the time the codes that come up for example will point to the O2 sensor and that can be a faulty O2 sensor but can also be manif manifold vacuum leaks in this area here. It can be the intake gasket, it can be anything um, that's causing it to suck too much air and therefore lodge a code. So the idea is we don't have codes um, or bad codes, you should get a passcode. Some older cars like uh, VL Commodores, I think it was, um, that used the RB30 engine had a di self diagnostic facility on the computer itself. It just had a red and a green LED, red for tens, greens for units, and it would flash codes almost like Morse code and you would read them off. Um, whereas these vehicles and anything subsequent to this, um, as far as I'm aware, use specialist equipment to read it. I'm under the car, so you're kind of upside down. O2 sensor, which measures the unburned oxygen in the exhaust that's all connected up. The starter motor, and I always forget that one, that little that little trigger. That trigger wire tells the starter motor to start when you put the key in the start position. Alternator wiring's in, and we're all clipped up in these areas here, so that's all good. Now another output we haven't discussed from the vehicle's ECU is the IACV, that's that white valve there. That's the idle air control valve. It's an output because if the idler starts to falter, that valve is told to let more air in. If it gets too high, it blocks the air off. It does most of its work when the engine started cold. It supplies more air and therefore more fuels injected, just to keep it running in a stable fashion. So that was certainly quite a long video, so I do apologise for that, because I wanted to include in this one how all of those sensors communicate with the ECU, or at least how they're connected to it, and what's inside the ECU. So we'll wait for the next video for that one. We'll also talk about fitting out the doors with the electrics and how an air conditioning system works, among a whole host of other things. So I hope you've enjoyed it again. Take good care of yourselves and I'll see you soon.
What do you reckon? Shit. Shit. <laughs> <laughs>